Essential Church Media Services presents Dr. Jack Rogers' class on Presbyterian Creeds. And now, here's Dr. Rogers. Thanks. We are here as people who care about the church, who bear responsibility in the church, who are office bearers in the church as deacons and elders and ministers of the word. And we're people who've taken this vow that we are going to sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as found in the confessions, and we're going to utilize those resources as we lead the people of God. Now, this session is designed to help us, to, to give us some resources so that we can do that with enthusiasm and imagination. And all the stuff I'm going to use, you can use. You can uh, find these things, I'm sure, in the resources of your local church because we're going to use the banners which were created by that wonderful pastoral church musician team, Avery and Marsh, who are pastor and choir master in Port Jarvis, New York. And how many of you have those banners in your churches at home? You know those banners? Surely. Okay, well, you're going to have to, here's what you got to do. You got to write to Avery and Marsh in Port Jarvis, send them 50 bucks and get the patterns to create the banners in your churches. Then Sherry and I led a tour to the sites where the confessions were developed, and we just took slides. I mean, it's just like home movies, folks. You can all do that. You've got people in your congregations, you yourselves perhaps have visited some of these places, but we're going to look at some pictures of a few of the places uh, where these things happened, as well as the banners, and we'll discover there's a lot of uh, understanding of theology and history that uh, come out of that. When Westminster Press asked me a few years ago to uh, write this little book, Presbyterian Creeds, A Guide to the Book of Confessions, they did that because at that time there was nothing in English that would give you a kind of a lead-in to understanding the Reformed Confessions. And it just gives you some historical background and then also lifts up some of the central doctrines and talks about some of the contemporary applications. So we're going to do that kind of stuff here together this morning. Now, our book of Confessions then begins with the uh, Nicene Creed. Now, look at that banner of the Nicene Creed there. What do, what do you see in the center of it? What's the central uh, figure there? Cross. It's a cross. It is a cross, so that tells us what the central doctrine of the Nicene Creed is, namely, the person of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is truly God and truly human in one integral human person. But notice the bottom of that cross. What does that look like? Sword. It's a sword. That reminds us of the historical context. The Council of Nicaea, which met in 325 AD, was not a church council. It was a political meeting. It was called by the Emperor Constantine. He had a big problem. His empire was beginning to come apart over religious quarrels, and he wanted that stopped, and he got all the religious leaders of the known world at that time together, and he sat them down in a room, said he'd pay for lunch, and they were going to get together there, and they were going to work out this central question, who is Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures. Now, it actually took them about 50 years to work this out. The Council of Nicaea met in 325, and then later in 381 was the Council of Constantinople. So the Nicene Creed really ought to be called the nicano constantinopolitan Creed. And if you stand in front of your mirror and say that several times real quick, you can get so you can impress your junior high youth group, see? That'll be very important uh, to you. Okay, now this creed which arose out of there had several factors there, but the main thing in it is saying who is God? God comes to us in Jesus Christ, and then what's that hand pointing down there? What, what does that symbolize? The hand. hand of God coming down to humanity. That's right. So that symbolizes the hand of God or God the Father. Then at the bottom of the cross, you see those are Greek letters. It's a chi and a rho. It looks like a P and an X to us, but in Greek, that's a chi and a rho. And those are the first two letters of Christos for Christ, you see. Now, Constantine, the emperor, was not a Christian, but when he was battling physically, I mean at war, trying to uh, unite the empire, he had this dream in which he saw those letters, chi, rho, and he decided that meant Christ was going to be his 
supporter and he had his soldiers paint that on their shields and they went into the Battle of Milvian Bridge in Italy and they won. If he'd have lost, I don't know what would become of all of us, but in any case they won and so he decided that he should be a supporter of the Christian church and not a persecutor as emperors before him had been and so that was the beginning of a relationship of church and state that was new to the Christian church. It has, has good things and it has problems in it as we all know. And then of course you see that white dove up there in the uh, right side of the banners you're looking at it, and that symbolizes what? Holy Spirit. So the main thing we learn in the Nicene Creed is who Jesus Christ is, that Christ is truly the Son of God, and that the Spirit is also one of the persons of the Trinity. Now all that gets more elaborated later on, but that's where the Christian church began in trying to understand what the most centrally important things that Christians needed to know were all about. Now the Apostles' Creed, which <clears throat> most of us know a lot better because it's shorter, it's simpler, most of us memorized it at some early point in our uh, uh, life, the Apostles' Creed has roots that really go back to the second century, even before the Nicene Creed, which gets developed in the fourth century finally. There was going around among Christians in secret a thing called the rule of faith, a, things that they could remember that were the essential doctrines that, that all Christians believe. Notice the banner there, you see, notice the somber colors. See, somebody said, ask an easy question like, what color? What color is this banner? See? <laughs> kind of brown, purple, but, but those, what do you think, what's the meaning of those kind of uh, semicircular uh, shapes that the symbols are in there? That's, yeah, it symbolizes the catacombs. This is from the period when the Christian church was being persecuted and Christians were actually hiding in the catacombs. Notice the bottom left hand symbol there in that kind of catacomb window. What, what does that symbolize, the cup? But what does it symbolize? Communion. Communion, the Lord's Supper. But you know, the Romans said terrible things about the Christians. They said they were cannibals, that they drank blood and ate flesh, you see. They misunderstood the symbolic and metaphorical character of the bread and wine, which we say are spiritually the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. So at first, the Christians didn't want people to know they were Christians because they would be persecuted, they would be misunderstood. Notice the bottom right-hand one there, the upside down cross. You know where that comes from? Martyrdom. Martyrdom, and especially Peter, the apostle, who said, because he had denied his Lord three times, that he was not worthy to be crucified and killed the same way his Lord Jesus Christ was. So he had him turn the cross upside down, and that's at least the tradition, that he was crucified head down. Then in the top left hand, there, you get the uh, symbol of the anchor, Christ is the anchor of our soul. And then what's that top right hand one for? That, that fish symbol. You know, I mean, we see it on bumper stickers and in people's car windows now. But why? What does it symbolize? You remember? Jesus symbolizes Jesus Christ because, again, if you take it's an acrostic, and if you take the letters in, uh, for ichthus, which is the Greek word for fish, they can symbolize Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior. So it is said that, you know, early Christians would sort of draw that symbol in the sand or something and it would identify to other Christians who they were without giving it away, you see, to the Roman authorities. So that we've got a lot of knowledge of what it is that um, Christian uh, church was all about and they're just wrapped up in these two banners. Now, these banners come from the period of what we would call the early Catholic Church, the universal church. The church was not yet divided. All Christians were one, and they were united on the basis of the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. You go through the Middle Ages, the church begins to get lazy and corrupt and go off on tangents, and there grew up then a period which we know joyfully as the Protestant Reformation. Now, my wife Sherry, was a Lutheran before we were married, and so I've made a solemn promise to her that I will always admit at some point that Luther had some small thing to do with the Reformation, <laughs> you know, before Calvin and the others uh, in the Reformed tradition came along. 
you know, Helen approves of that too. That's great. <laughs> now, look at this picture. This is the statue of uh, Luther in Worms. But I want you first to notice the figures at the base of the statue. If you could see around behind, there are actually four persons memorialized there, and they are what we call pre-reformers. These were people who, during the Middle Ages, before Luther, were preaching the gospel of free grace, that we didn't have to work for our salvation, but that God freely gave us salvation in Jesus Christ. Can you name one of those pre-reformers? John Huss. And Luther later said, I would be proud to be called a Hussite. John Huss, you see, was one in the area of, uh, we now call Germany, Austria, that area, you see. He was preaching the gospel of free grace before Luther. Name another one. There's an, an Englishman. Do you remember, think of an English person? There's a wonderful young person's book called The Hawk That Dare Not Fly By Day. And it's about John Wycliffe, that's right, who was always on the run from the church authorities because he was trying to translate the Bible into English so that uh, everyone could read it, you see. And that was a crime, you see, in his time, before the Protestant Reformation. The Bible could only be in Latin, you see, so that the was the product of the priests and so on, their province. So John Huss is another. And then there are two Italians, one in northern Italy and one in southern Italy. One of them is still has his name given to a small Protestant group. Have you heard of the Waldensians? There was a man named Peter Waldo in the north of Italy who preached the gospel of free grace before the Reformation. And in the south of Italy, a man who died at the, burned at the stake for his faith, Savannarola. Yes. So here you've got these four people, Huss and Wycliffe and Waldo and Savannarola. There were people who, from their reading of Scripture, understood what Martin Luther later came to understand, namely that God gave grace freely and was willing to accept us not on the basis of our sins, but on the basis of what Jesus Christ had done for us by living and dying on the cross and rising for our sins. Now, why is it that everybody knows about Martin Luther and very few people have heard of a guy named Ulrich Zwingli? Well, obviously, Luther had a better press agent. No, that wasn't the whole thing. <laughs> Look at this slide. That tells the whole story. Zwingli was preaching in a little bitty village down in the valleys between those mountains, but he, Zwingli later said, I was preaching the gospel of free grace for a year before Martin Luther posted his 95 Theses. But it wasn't until later that Zwingli became the pastor in the cathedral church in Zurich that anybody learned about his message. Now here's a picture of Zwingli. What does he have in his hand? It's like a sword. Yeah, it's a sword. You see, we all are inconsistent at certain points. Zwingli wrote some wonderful tracts on peacemaking and said Swiss ought not to be mercenaries and other people's armies and so on. But in the pressure of the moment, he took up arms, he became the chaplain to a Protestant military contingent and died in full battle dress uh, in a fight between a Protestant and a Roman Catholic canton or region of Switzerland there, you see. Now Zwingli was one of these kind of spontaneous, aggressive, outgoing kind of people, and people say without Zwingli, the Reformation in Switzerland probably never would have begun. But the person we know most about and think most about when we think of the Swiss Reformation was a guy named John Calvin. Now Calvin was not the first to come to Geneva, where we think about him and try to reform it. There was an itinerant French pastor who had to flee from France when, because of his Protestant convictions called Farrell. And Farrell got to Geneva and he discovered a group of people meeting on Sundays down on the shores of Lake Geneva. These people were having Bible study. And he discovered that they were what we would call Protestants. I mean, they understood that they could come directly to God and they didn't have to go through a priest and all of these things. So he began to minister with them and preach to them. And one Sunday afternoon they said, look, we are surely the true Christians. Why do we have to meet out here in the open? Why can't we meet in the cathedral in town, St. Pierre, St. Peter's Church? And so they got themselves together and Sunday afternoon they marched right up there to St. Peter's Church. Now these were obviously Presbyterians because 
they did it decently and in order. <laughs> they didn't break any windows. They didn't burn anything. They just went in there and quietly sat in the church on Sunday afternoon. And it so impressed the governing body, the city council there in Geneva, Switzerland, that they decided to have a plebiscite. They would let the people vote on whether they wanted to be Protestant or Catholic, and they voted to be Protestant. And so Farrell and Calvin then became the reformers of the city of Geneva. Now, uh, Farrell, you know, was there first, and there came this itinerant young scholar, he was only in his late 20s, who actually was on the lam because of his Protestant convictions. He didn't mean to go to Geneva at all, this young John Calvin. He was just detouring around a war that was going on, and uh, he met Farrell, <clears throat> and Farrell learned who he was, and he said, you must stay here in Geneva and help me reform the city. Calvin said, I can't do that. I'm a scholar. I, I, I don't have any stomach for administration. Now, Farrell had been well-trained in non-directive counseling. He knew how to comfort people and make them feel comfortable, and so he said to him, God will damn your soul to hell if you don't stay here and help me. <laughs> so Calvin said, yes, sir, absolutely right. Where do I start? You know, see. So Calvin stayed there in Geneva with Farrell. They both got kicked out pretty soon, and then the city father decided the place was worse without them than it was with them and called them back, and they developed then the Reformation in Geneva. Now, you look at this slide, and on the left is Farrell. Then out a little bit forward, there is John Calvin. Next to Calvin is Calvin's, a person Calvin brought, Theodore Beza, another Frenchman, that he brought down to start the Genevan Academy, which now is the University of Geneva. See, Protestants, especially Reformed Protestants, have always believed in education not just for ministers, for everybody. If you're going to study the Bible, you see, you've got to be educated. So we have uh, Beza there, and then we have John Knox, who when he was a refugee, came and studied with Calvin in Geneva and called it the most perfect school of Christ that ever was on earth since the days of the apostles. Now, that slide, you remember seeing that, that picture of those four guys standing there, those four statues? Okay. Each one of them has a book in his hand. Now, one of those is the true Presbyterian. I want you to guess which one. Three of them have got Bibles in their hands, Pharaoh, Calvin, and Knox. But what does Beza have in his hand? The Book of Order. No, not quite, but just about. <laughs> Beza has in his hand the governing rules of the Genevan Academy, you see. So Presbyterians are people, you see, who believe that the Bible is going to issue in practical guidelines for how we go about educating people and transforming society. Now let's go to John Knox. He studied in Geneva and then he took these Reformation teachings back to Scotland. Here's the banner for the Scots Confession of 1560. Notice there at the top, what kind of a cross is that white cross you see there? That's a Celtic cross. So, so we've got a cross that's indigenous to that part of the world, to Scotland, all right? But behind that white Celtic cross, there's a reddish X. That's also a cross, you see. That's called the, you know what kind of cross that is? It's called a St. Andrew's cross. But whose plaid is that? I mean, if you go to, to Scotland, even if your name is Grabowowitz or something, <laughs> they'll find a plaid for you until you've got Scottish ancestors. But that's an authentic Scots plaid. And do you know whose plaid that is? That's the Hamilton plaid, because Patrick Hamilton was the first martyr for the Protestant faith in Scotland. See, it was not ministers, it was lay people who started the Reformation in Scotland. It was Lutheran fishermen who brought tracts by Luther over to Scotland, and Hamilton got one of these and read it, and he then began to study the Bible, and he began to be convinced that you could come directly into relationship to God in a way that he had not learned from his priests. Scotland was very corrupt in the church at that time. The priests were uneducated. Basically, landlords held the revenues of the church. They were really oppressing the people. And an example of that is when Hamilton began to preach, the archbishop, a man named Beaton, called him to the castle to have a discussion about this, and the next morning burned him at the stake. He thought he was going to stamp this out, but there's a wonderful Scottish expression, the smoke 
that did arise from Hamilton's body infected all those it did blow upon. And one of the people infected was a man named George Wishart, who picked up Hamilton's cause, began to go around preaching, and in a little village he met a young priest, tutor to a wealthy family called John Knox. And Knox was persuaded by what he learned from Wishart, that he should see in the Bible this new relationship to God, justification by faith. And he says, I want to go with you. And Wishart says, one is enough for a sacrifice. A few hours later, Cardinal Beaton's men caught up with Wishart, took him to the castle, burned him at the stake. Now, the Protestants then just, I mean, people, people in general rose up against this oppression and a small group crashed into the castle, killed the archbishop, occupied it, and the government brought in French troops and warships up the Firth, took over the castle, and John Knox became a galley slave in a French ship, half naked, chained to an oar for 19 months till Queen Elizabeth intervened to get him out. So Knox then took up the cause and he became the one who began to preach boldly the Reformation. This is Glasgow Cathedral and Knox had a confrontation there with the Queen Mother, Mary of Guise. She at first thought she would arrest him and and try him for heresy and for some reason she decided not to do that. So she tried everything. She tried to flirt with him and then she tried to ridicule him and she had him burned in effigy and nothing worked. Knox stuck to his guns, he kept preaching the gospel and the movement began to grow. So then she decided, let's try what Beaton used to try. So she invited him to Stirling Castle. And this is, if you were looking out the windows of Stirling Castle across this plain here, she looked out the window and she saw John Knox coming, but with 500 armed men. He decided if you kind of, you know, even up the sides, the debate goes a little better, you know. So this is Stirling Castle, to which Knox came for a theological discussion, but it had gone way beyond the point of discussion then. It was civil war, and you had the French on the side of the royal house, and then the English came in on the side of the rebels, the Protestant rebels, and the country was at full-scale civil war. The Queen Mother died suddenly. The Protestants won the battle, and John Knox and five friends were asked by the Scottish Parliament to write a confession of faith to unify the country. So once again, it was the civil government that wanted help from the church to reform the nation. So later, John Knox became the preaching pastor here at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, which is the principal cathedral there in the capital city. So that we see that these concepts like election, that God has chosen us and covenant, that God has called us, see those give strength to people to meet really tough times as Knox and his friends had to meet the time of civil war. Now a similar kind of a situation occurred in Heidelberg in Germany where uh, we have the development of the Heidelberg Catechism. And there <clears throat> uh, you had a German prince who had grown up in a very corrupt Catholic court who married a Lutheran Protestant princess and they went to Heidelberg to begin their rule there in a, what's called a palatinate, which is like a state, you see. And out of that, at his request, came the Heidelberg Catechism. Now look at this banner. If you don't remember anything else from this tape, I want you to remember the order of the three symbols across the top of this banner. What's the one there furthest on your left? The crown of thorns. That stands theologically for our sin and misery. Then the central one is what? It's a cross. It's a German cross. That stands for our redemption in Christ. And then the one on the right, what's that? Yeah, it's a tablet of the law, the Ten Commandments. Now remember the order in which those come. Sin, salvation, and service. Guilt, grace, and gratitude. A characteristic of our family heritage, the Reformed tradition, is that the law comes after we have been assured of our salvation. 
See, there are three uses of the law. The first use is to remind us of our sin, to bring us to salvation. That's what Luther emphasized. So if you're having a worship service in a Lutheran church and you're going to use the Ten Commandments, you would put them where? Right at the beginning, you see, because you want people to know they're sinners in order that they will accept the free grace of God in Jesus Christ. The second use of the law is just to keep civil order. I mean, you know, keep your nose clean and don't steal because it's a good idea and it keeps the country running better and all that. So everybody's kind of for the Ten Commandments, whether they're religious or not. But the third use of the law is gratitude to show us how to live as people who are grateful that God has already saved us in Jesus Christ. We don't have to do anything to earn it. Remember how the Ten Commandments start. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Therefore, see, you've already been saved. God is our liberator. God has already liberated us. Now the function of the law is just to teach us the simplest way to live the Christian life. So remember that order that the law comes after grace. That's characteristic of the Reformed tradition. That's freeing for us. Then down at the bottom, you have those three symbols who are symbols for, again, Father and Son and Holy Spirit in Hebrew and Greek and a uh, visual symbol there. Now, when um, the Elector of the Palatinate, Frederick, came to pick up his rule here, and this is Heidelberg Castle, where he and his wife lived up high on the hill there. And when they looked down from the castle there, and here you, you see one of the towers of the castle, and they're up, just imagine them up there kind of looking down toward the beautiful Necker River there running through Heidelberg. And down there they would see this church, which is called the Holy Ghost Church. Now the pastor of that church, when Frederick became the elector or the governor of this area, was a very stiff-necked high Lutheran called Hessius. And he had as an assistant pastor a young reformed man named Klebitz. Now I often used to, when I taught in seminary, use this to teach some things about uh, church administration, you know. The high Lutheran past senior pastor and the reformed associate pastor didn't get along. So one Sunday morning when it was the associate's time to serve communion, he was holding up the communion cup and the senior pastor grabbed it out of his hand they got in a fist fight in the chancel. Another good, you know, process for working things out, you understand? Well, in those days, the committee on ministry was the elector. Frederick sent them both packing, but he gave a good recommendation to the reformed associate pastor and a bad recommendation to the senior Lutheran pastor. Well, that caused him a lot of trouble later on because the, the Lutheran senior pastor whipped up the Lutherans who were the head of the other Palatinate's other regions and they actually called him up before the Emperor Maximilian and his throne and his life was on the line because they said, what is this Heidelberg Catechism you have here? It's not Lutheran, it's not Catholic. See, there's something wrong with it. He got two, after he dismissed those guys, he got two very young men, a man named Olavianus, uh, who came to pastor the Holy Ghost Church and a man named Zacharias or Sinus came to be the head theologian at the college there that was teaching theology and had them write the Heidelberg Catechism which gave a reformed emphasis. So when Frederick got called before the emperor and these other rulers and they were actually threatening his life, he remembered the first question and answer in that Heidelberg Catechism. The first question is, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And Frederick answered with the answer to the Heidelberg Catechism that I am not my own, but that I belong body and soul to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, you see. He stood there with courage, calm before these people. They were so impressed by his demeanor that they said, oh, Fritz, you're more pious than a lot of us. And they let him off, <laughs> you know, you see. So uh, it reminded me when I listened to that, you know, comfort. We, out here in California, we know what comfort means. I mean, comfort's hot tubs, being laid back, all that kind of stuff, see? So, so the word comfort means something different to us than it meant in the 16th century. The word comfort comes from the Latin word fortis, which means strength. See, if you meet a friend of yours in the grocery store here, and you chat for a while, and then you go your separate ways, what do you say? You say, have a good day, probably, okay? 
if it, Sherry and I lived in the Netherlands for five years off and on, and, and if you meet your friend in the Netherlands in the grocery store and you chat and then go your separate way, what you say to them is, Sperkte. Sperkte says, be tough. See, they never expect to be comfortable in our sense of comfort. So knowing that life is going to be tough, the best thing you can say to your friend is, be strong. You see? That's what the Heidelberg Catechism. What is what gives you strength? when the chips are down in life, that you belong body and soul to Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. See? Well, that's some of what we learned in the Netherlands, you know, because that Heidelberg Catechism has gotten embedded in the life of people in the Netherlands as it has in other countries where that has become the chief theological resource. Well, let's turn our attention now to Switzerland and the Second Helvetic Confession which grew out of the writings of a man named Heinrich Bullinger. Just as they said the Reformation would never have gotten started in Switzerland without Zwingli, it would never have lasted without Bullinger, who was the pastor following Zwingli in Zurich before Calvin ever came to Geneva, and he was still pastor 11 years after Calvin died. So he was really the senior pastor of the Reformed movement. And he wrote this Second Helvetic Confession after a plague came through and his wife and daughter died in the plague. He thought he was going to die. And he wrote the Second Helvetic Confession as his gift to the city of Zurich and had it attached to his will. You see, now here, look at the banner. In the upper left-hand corner there of the banner, you have what is a traditional Reformed Calvinist symbol. I hold my heart in my hand and offer it sincerely to you, O God. You see. What's in the upper right hand corner? What's the symbol there? The lamp, but what do you suppose it symbolizes? What's it meant to indicate? I am the light. Yes, you could say Christ, I am the light of the world. And the whole idea of knowledge, that there is a commitment to education on the part of reformed people. And then in the lower left, that crook, you know, symbolizes what? The shepherd. the shepherd, the pastoral character. Great deal of pastoral material um, there in the Second Helvetic Confession. And then on the right, kind of waves and a cup would symbolize what? The, the two sacraments. Baptism, where we are immersed in the, in the water, you know, symbolizing the washing away of our sins. And communion, where we meet Christ truly spiritually in the elements of the bread and the wine there. Now once again, we have here a Swiss city, Zurich, up in the mountains. And uh, to get there, you move around these beautiful lakes. And uh, you come to the cathedral church there in Zurich, where both Zwingli and Bullinger preached. Look at the front part of that uh, slide and to the right of the church there. You see the man on horseback, the statue there. You know what that stands for? The Emperor Charlemagne was riding his horse through this area and the horse stumbled. Now the Emperor was either very religious or very superstitious, we're not sure which, but he believed that the horse was bowing down at the grave of martyrs. And so he had this cathedral church built there. And if you could see the top there on top of the spires, that's not a cross, that's a crown. It's the Emperor Charlemagne's crown. So, you know, he always wanted to remind you who built the church there for the folks, so they're eternally grateful to him. Well, when you go inside that church, then, you're going to see the simplicity that came with the Protestant Reformation. Yes, you have the beautiful stained glass windows that they, they were decent and orderly, didn't break out. But notice they whitewashed the walls. Zwingli himself was a wonderful musician. He took the organ out and he put that pulpit there in, which wasn't there before, because the whole point of the Reformation was directing people's attention to the Bible, to the Word of God, to bring them into contact with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Zwingli was afraid people would be distracted by the beauty of the music. So they took away all the statues and pictures and everything, not because they were against art, but because they wanted to focus people's attention on the central essentials of the Word of God. So that if you go around behind this church, you see this statue of Bullinger, the man who wrote the Second Helvetic Confession, who was really the senior pastor 
of the Reformed movement. Now, most of us, <coughs> folks of our age, when we think of a Reformed confession, we're going to think of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Because up until 1967, Westminster was the single confession of the Presbyterians in this country. And in, it was in just in 1967 that we got the Book of Confession showing that we had a broader, even richer, Reformed heritage. But here's the banner for the Westminster Confession. Look at the center of it there. Uh, what, what, is, what is that symbol? The seeing eye, which is the, sen the symbol of the sovereignty of God. And it's all embossed there on what? What is that white squarish thing probably? It's, it's an open book, so it's the Bible. And the Westminster Confession in its very first chapter tells us about the authority and proper interpretation of the scriptures, the word of God. And then, you know, you have the, at the top, you have those two crosses, and at the bottom, the Alpha and the Omega. Again, the sovereignty of God is strong in Westminster. God is there at the beginning and at the end. And you have the crown, which reminds you of the sovereignty of God. But also, again, that the king played a very important role in this. As a matter of fact, several kings did. Let's go back a little bit into English history and get a sense about the Westminster Confession. This is the plain at Runnymede where King John met with the British nobles at one time and they forced him to sign a document called the Magna Carta, which is the Charter of Liberty for English-speaking people. A lot of people don't like the Westminster. They think of it as a very harsh and authoritarian document. In its own time, it was a Charter of Liberty for English-speaking Protestant people. The English Parliament convened the Westminster Assembly. And they worked from 1643 to 1646 developing the Westminster Confession and the larger and shorter catechism. Now, the, the country is in the meantime in civil war. The king and the high church Anglicans are fighting against the parliament and the mostly Presbyterian Protestants. But the Presbyterians had hired as their general to prosecute the war a man named Oliver Cromwell. Now, Cromwell wasn't a Presbyterian. He was an independent. This is a statue of Cromwell. What Cromwell wanted was toleration for all religions. What the Presbyterian is wanted was that Presbyterian would become the English state religion, you see. And so things got worse and worse. Cromwell won the war, cut the king's head off. The Presbyterians were horrified by this, didn't know what to do, and collapsed then as a political movement in England. And so though it was created in England, the Westminster Confession of Faith never became the Confession of England. But there were five Scottish delegates to the assembly, and they took it back to Scotland, and it became the Confession of Faith of the Church of Scotland and came to our country from there. Well, we've got to jump to the 20th century because there are Reformed confessions in our own century that have been important to us. Here's a simple but very powerful banner. The Barman Declaration from 1934, a declaration against the threat of Nazism on the Christian church. And you see the cross there in flames and the, uh, the uh, swastika, the symbol of Nazism, crossed out. You know. Sherry and I had the chance of visiting Berlin at about Christmas time of 1960 uh, before the Berlin Wall was built, and it was easy to go back and forth between East and West. And here in what is now East Berlin is the Reichstag building, the Parliament building, you see. In February of 1933, the Parliament was burned, and Adolf Hitler used that as an excuse to suspend civil liberties, you see. But he was a very cunning man. When he suspended civil liberties, he also said that he would not disturb the church. You see, so he kept playing that game of taking things away from people and assuring the church that it would not be disturbed, you see. By April of 1933, there were a group of people called the German Christians, a group of people who were fervent Nazi supporters. They didn't understand what was going on there. By the fall of that year, there were a few people who began to understand the threat. And a principal one was a man named Martin Niemöller. He'd been a U-boat commander in the First World War and a decorated military hero, 
but he realized that Hitler was basically anti-Christian and against the welfare of the people of Germany. And he gathered a group called the Pastors Emergency League to stand against Hitler. And there came a time in February of 1934, no, January, January 25th, 1934, when a group of leaders from the Pastors Emergency League and Niemöller met with Hitler to try to negotiate. And Hitler said, you take care of the church, but leave the German people to me. And Niemöller said, we cannot do that. God has called us to the welfare of the whole people, not just the church. And Hitler was furious with them, you see. But that was the way they had to stand. In May then, a small group of mostly young people gathered in a little town of Barman along the Rhine River and wrote the Barman Declaration, which said, there's no political language in it at all. It's very simple. It says, Jesus Christ is Lord. But that means Adolf Hitler is not Lord, you see. Well, the German people suffered very, very much. This is the destruction you could still see in East Berlin there in 1960, 15 years after the war was over. But Sherry and I visited another city in Germany, too. And, oh, yeah, before we leave Berlin there, there's the spire of the Dahlem Church, which has never been rebuilt. It's been left as a symbol of the destruction of the war to remind people, you see, there in Berlin, of the tragic consequences of following a leader like Hitler. But now when you get near Munich, Sherry and I visited this place. If you could get closer to that marker there, you would read on it that it says in German, in honor of the dead and as a warning to the living. And if you were to go inside that building, you would see ovens. Thousands of Jews were cremated. This is Dachau. This is what happens when men like Adolf Hitler are allowed to lead even the church astray from following the path of Jesus Christ. Well, Karl Barth was the man who wrote the Barman Declaration. And over his desk in his study in Basel in Switzerland, Karl Barth had, this, had a copy of this painting. The, the original of this is a more than life-size painting on wood in a little town of Colmar in southern France. It was painted by one of the first Protestant painters, a man named Matthias Grunewald, and it shows Christ on the cross, and it's, it's realistic. You know, it's not kind of holy, stiff people with halos around their head like in the medieval painting. This Christ has blood dripping from the, his wounds. There are flies on the blood, you see, and it was a leper hospital. Incurably ill people were brought here to see how much Christ had suffered. But it's a visual aid. You can refold the panels, and then what you will see on the other side is this picture of the glorious resurrected Christ to say that even as Christ suffered and you are suffering, Christ was raised, and in Christ we too will be raised to a new wholeness of life. Well, we have continued to try to be reformed as Christian people, and we've moved on in our own century in this country to struggle with some of the great social problems uh, in our own life, and we came to the Confession of 1967, right in the middle of the great upheaval of the 60s, and, and what was the basic issue then that we were grappling with, and you can see evidence of it in this banner. What was... The civil rights struggle. So you see in this banner the, the hands of different colors. The theme of this banner is reconciliation. This banner is a little busy aesthetically for me, but what it's trying to show are the stars and the planets and so in the background there behind the cross to say this is the space age too. We're confronting new challenges that we hadn't confronted before. Well, I want us to uh, first of all have a look at uh, Princeton Seminary. I know some of you in the audience here, graduates of Princeton, but the writers of the, bar, of the uh, Confession of 1967 were primarily professors and graduates of Princeton Seminary, and they'd been greatly influenced by Karl Barth and the Barman Declaration. And they felt we needed to do something like that in this country to address problems like race and poverty and war and anarchy and sexual relationships, the great four social themes that are dealt with in the Confession of 1967. I want to take you quickly to another country 
Do anybody know where this is? You know the spire of that church there? That's Coventry in England. And I take us there because Coventry became a symbol of reconciliation in Europe. One of the great stories is that the British had cracked the Nazis' secret code and Winston Churchill knew the Germans were going to bomb the city of Coventry, but he didn't dare tell the people because then the Germans would know they'd cracked the code, see, and they needed it. So Coventry Cathedral was bombed out there. And you can see that they did not rebuild it, but they left just the shell of the cathedral. And what they did is have work camps and conferences and brought young people from all over Europe together there to study how they could be reconciled to one another. See the plaque there says, Father, forgive, at one point. So what they did then is they built a new modern cathedral alongside the old bombed out one. And you walk down this hallway with these beautiful stained glass windows. And you come then into the sanctuary and are just awestruck by this magnificent tapestry done by Graham Sutherland of the resurrected, triumphant Jesus Christ, you see. And so that reconciliation takes place because we are in Christ. Christ is ultimately the reconciler that brings us together. And so our present book of Confessions ends where it begins, with a focus on Christ. We began to try to understand who is Jesus Christ, both God and human and one integral person, and we end with the notion that Christ is triumphant. Christ is the reconciler over all the things that divide us. Now, at present, that's the end of the story because that's the end of the book of Confessions. But Presbyterians are right now in the process of continually being reformed. We're writing a new confession called the Brief Statement of Faith, and I've had the privilege of being one of the 21 people that have done that. It was the reunion of Northern and Southern Presbyterians in 83 that mandated that a group representing diversity in the church be brought together to write a new statement of faith. And we do represent diversity. I'll show you a picture of some of, the, some of the people on that brief statement committee. We were meeting down in Texas at one point in the summer, and notice that's a woman walking up. For the first time, well, C67 had one woman on the committee, but our committee was half women and men. It was elders, ministers of the word, members, and it was people of various racial and ethnic backgrounds. And that's not been the case before. So we were called together to represent the diversity in the church. And we worked together for five years. We had 50 days just of committee meetings. And you put that 300 hours of committee meetings times 21 people, that's 6,000 person hours that went into producing a document called a brief statement of faith that only takes two pages, you see. So we struggled to not say anything new, but to just say, what does it mean to be Christian, to be Protestant, and to be Reformed? But you know what? We did say some new things. Because as we struggled together in our diversity and were driven back to the scriptures, the word of God, we said there are some things we need to emphasize that haven't been as clearly emphasized before in the Reformed Confessions. We said something new about Jesus Christ. We talked about Christ's life and ministry. The Reformation tends to jump from Christ's birth to death because that is for our salvation. But my friend Bill Pinnell, who heads black ministries at Fuller, says, the question now is, where may I find a gracious neighbor? And we wanted to say Christ is neighbor to those who have none, and we must be too. And we said also something new about ourselves. We said women and men are created equally in the image of God, you see. Because we wanted to emphasize that all people, all people are equally in the image of God and may be called to all the ministries of the church. And then we struggled with this most difficult question, and yet in a way I think that's very biblical, how do you talk about God, you see? Many years ago, I read one of these little kids' books about God, you know, and a little girl wrote a letter and said, Dear God, are boys really better than girls? I know you're a boy, but try to be fair. Signed, Sylvia. See? Well, this is our problem. We believe God is a person with whom we can have a personal relationship, yet the only kind of persons we know 
are male persons or female persons. So we say, as the Bible said, God is like a mother, God is like a father, you see. All right, we are reformed. We're drawing on all of that richness of our book of confessions, but we and you, all of us together, are going to continue to be reformed and to understand what it means to live out the grace of God in our present world, drawing on the resources of our family heritage in the Book of Confessions. You're going to do it. You're going to do it well. I'm proud of you. Let's go out there together and try to bring people into a better understanding of our Christian, Protestant, and Reformed heritage. Thanks very much for joining us today.